the stories told of a man from Kansas City who was severely injured in an explosion. His face was very badly disfigured, and to make it worse, he lost his eyesight as well as both of his arms. This was not only tragic physically, but also spiritually, because the man was a new Christian, and one of his greatest disappointments was not being able to read the Bible any longer. Then he heard about a woman uh, from England who learned to read Braille with her lips. So hoping to do the same, he got some books of the Bible in Braille. He was so excited when they arrived, but much to his surprise, he discovered that the nerve endings on his lips were also damaged, and he could not use his lips to read Braille as he thought. No eyesight, no hands, no lips to read Braille. But he never gave up trying. And one day, as he was trying to read one of the Braille pages, his tongue happened to touch a few of the Braille characters, and he could actually feel them. Then a thought came to his mind, I can read the Bible using my tongue. Using his tongue, he was able to read the Bible several times through. I don't know about you, but that puts me to shame. (laughs) We have hands, we have sight, and we have sound even, but don't go through the same efforts to read the word. I could say amen and we'd be done, right? That's enough. (laughs) But Peter encourages us to be intimate with the Word of God. He's saying if you are a genuine Christian, one of the marks will be you be rightly related to the Word of God. Will you turn in your Bibles to the epistle of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, There are Bibles in the seats under under you in front. If you don't have one, um, feel free to use a table of contents. Peter is uh, towards the back of the New Testament. If you find the book of Revelation and scroll back just a few books, you'll find the epistle of 1 Peter. It's important that we're all there just so you know I'm not just making up what's happening here. But in our passage today, Peter addresses the issue of our relationship with the Word of God. It was Spurgeon who said, Visit many good books, but live in the Bible. John Wesley stated, I am a man of one book. John Bunyan remarked, I was never out of my Bible. And then someone else quipped, A Bible in the hand is worth two in the bookcase. And many times we ask ourselves, How can I have more power in my life? How can God use me more in this world? And the answer is, we will be used only as much as we are close to the Word of God and to be obedient to what he tells us to do. We all know who George Mueller is. Perhaps you've heard of him. Um, he was a great prayer warrior of the 1800s. He, he ran many orphanages. Um, he was a pastor as well. But George Mueller, who, by the way, read through the Bible uh, maybe over 100 times, he makes this statement. Listen as I read his statement. He says, I look upon it as a lost day when I have not had a good time over the word of God. He says, friends often say, I have so much to do, so many people to see, I cannot find time for the scripture study. Perhaps there are not many who have more to do than I. For more than a half a century, I've never known one day, George Mueller says, when I have not had more business than I could get through. He says, for four years, I have had annually about 30,000 letters, and most of those have passed through my own hands. Then as pastor of a church with 1,200 believers, great has been my care. He says, besides, I have had charge of five immense orphanages, also at my publishing depot, the printing and circulating of millions of tracts, books, and Bibles. 
but I've always made it a rule never to begin work until I've had a good season with God and his word. The blessing I've received, he says, has been wonderful. No wonder God was able to work through him. Go home and look up George Mueller and just read some of the stories that he talks about in terms of how God has worked in his life. For example, he's at his orphanage and the kids are there, there's no dinner. And he tells the kids to go sit at the dinner table and they're like, why are we here? There's no food. And he leads them in grace. And no sooner does he lead them in grace, there was a knock on the door and it was a milk wagon. The axle broke. The guy couldn't go on with it. He said, I figured you could use the milk so it doesn't go as bad. Those are the kinds of things that God did in his life. And he started the day in the word of God and with prayer. But George Mueller was a person with flesh and blood just like us, just like James says and Elijah says. And so God can do the same thing through us if we're willing to be intimate with his word. So today I want us to observe several things about this passage and about the word of God. And I want to encourage us to be consumers of the word. And so if you're taking notes in your note-taking outline, there's one in the bulletin, I want you to see firstly and foundationally that God's word, God's infallible word gives us truth. God's infallible word gives us truth. Now, infallible literally means the inability to be wrong, the inability to be wrong. That means that the Bible is without error. And it's completely true. Look at verse 22 here. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. He says, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Do you see his view of the scripture here? We see it right here in this verse. He calls it truth here. We see that in other parts of the scripture as well. In John 17, 17, Jesus is speaking and he says, Sanctify them in the truth your word is truth. We see the psalmist speak about this in Psalm 119, 160. He says, the sum of your word is truth. And so Peter is saying here the same thing. Peter is saying it is truth and it is pure. And if you think about it, the infallibility of the word of God is being questioned today more than any other time that, it's, that we've seen it. People don't regard what God has to say in his word anymore. And that's no surprise because it started to be attacked way back in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember Genesis 3, 1 to 3, indeed, this is the devil speaking here, indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And so we see there from the beginning, right from the beginning, the father of lies has questioned the integrity of the word of God. Look back at um, chapter 1 in 1 Peter here at verse 10. You're, in, you're, in, you're right there, but look at, at verse 10 and 11. It says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And so Peter reminds us here that these Old Testament prophets, as they were writing Scripture, that they were not writing it independent of God. They were writing it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Here he's called the Spirit of Christ, we see here in Verse 11, and he, the Spirit of Christ was working through them about certain prophecies. And, and this one here that he's talking about in verses 10 and 11 is about the sufferings of Christ. The Old Testament prophets saw the sufferings of Christ. Christ hadn't come yet, but they saw that he was going to die and he was going to suffer for our sins. But they also saw the glories to follow. And that's what prophecy is about. It is history pre-written. 
And here are these men, they lived hundreds of years before Christ was incarnated, and they saw his crucifixion. And not only did they see his crucifixion, but they saw his coronation when he would uh, rule on this earth. They saw the sufferings of Christ, and they saw the glories that would follow. They saw his first coming, but they also saw his second coming. They saw the cross, but they also saw his crown. And they could write about this even before it happened, Peter's telling us in verses 10 and 11. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ worked through them to show them what would happen. And so Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1.21, For no prophecy of Scripture was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And just like the wind fills the sails of a ship so that it could move along, um, it is God who moved these men along as they wrote Scripture. Paul could write in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired by God. And we see that word inspired there is the word theonusto. It means God breathe. All scripture is the breath of God. And since God is perfect and infallible, so is his word. Calvin, John Calvin, he called it the sure and infallible standard. Luther said of scriptures that the scriptures have never erred. It is impossible that scriptures would ever contradict itself and appears so only to the senseless and obstinate hypocrite. And so Peter says here in verse 22 uh, of, our, of our text here, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls <clears throat> for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. And so <clears throat> it is our response to the truth of the gospel message and the forgiveness of sin that comes from it when we respond to the gospel that gives us the basis then for loving one another. He calls it here in verse 22, you saw it there, he calls it a sincere love. Um, sincere is the word anupokritos. Did you hear the word ending? Upokritos. What does it sound like? We, it kind of comes down and it's transliterated into our English word hypocrite. Hypocrite. Upokritos. Hypocrite. And so he's, he, we know a hypocrite is someone who acts in a way that they're not. In, a, in essence, it's someone who is a play actor. They're acting on the stage of life, if you will. That's who an hypocrite is. And, and, but he adds the prefix an to it, anupokritos. An means without. And so he's saying here, when he says that we are to have a sincere love, he's saying we are to have a love with, without hypocrisy or a non-hypocritical type of love. When we think about it, sometimes we can pretend to love people. And Peter here is talking about a genuine type of love. He's saying, let this not be a, a hypocritical love. Let it be genuine. And so this is a love where we give rather than trying to get what we want. And then Peter adds at the end of the verse, he says, fervently love one another, verse 22, from one another from the heart. You could underline that word fervently, and, and it's a word that means intensely. And this was an athletic term that described the, the discipline that an athlete gives to the sport. You know, we've been uh, watching uh, the Olympics, and um, my favorite's always sprinting, you know, track and field. I, I love to watch that. And you watch these athletes, and they give such discipline um, for years and years um, to their sport. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying that loving God's people ought to be something that we discipline ourselves to do, something that we work intently on. It's not just a, a feeling or a passing feeling. He says we need to choose to love and we need to keep working at it fervently. We see in 1 John 3, 14 where it says, we know that we have passed from death into life 
because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Can you show that? Put that verse up, Lily. Thank you. So Peter's point is this, that since you have been, been exposed to the truth and you have responded to it, that same truth becomes the basis for loving God's people. So it starts with responding to the word of God. We respond, we hear it, we respond to it. And that's the basis for us loving one another, loving God's people. But not only is it a basis for loving one another, but uh, notice, uh, letter B, that it's the basis for, it causes, the word causes our second birth. All right? We saw letter A, that the word helps us love each other. And letter B, we see that the word causes our second birth. Verse 23 says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Now we see that word for at the beginning of verse 23 there. And it means because. So he says in verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart because you have been born again, not of the seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. And so Peter is reminding us that I am to fervently love you. You are to fervently love me. We are to fervently love each other. Why? Because we have the same father. We should realize that being born again puts us into the same family, and therefore we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Spirit, the same spiritual seed that brought about, can you grab me one of those? Is the same that we that brought about mine. Look at verse 23 again. For you have been born again not of spiritual, of, of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. That's verse 23. Now follow the flow of thought here. He's talking about our spiritual birth here in verse 23. We have all been born in a physical way, right? If we're here, we've been born, born physically. But the physical birth is perishable. Our, our physical bodies are, are perishable. We will all die physically someday. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being born again. This is our second birth. This is verse 23 here. And if we have been born again, then you have been born again by a seed that is imperishable. And so while we may die physically, we will, after we're born physically, we will never die once we're born again. We will live on and we will have eternal life in heaven. And no one will be in heaven apart from the word of God. It's the word of God that we hear, that we respond to, that saves us. And so that brings us to letter C, that the word of God will last forever. He says in verse 24, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. He says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. He's telling us that the word of God is the only constant thing that is there. He talks about the flowers, the flowers come, and a week later they're wilted and gone. But he says the word of God does not wilt. It does not fall off. It doesn't fade away. Many people have tried to destroy the word of God. Many people have scorned it. They've tried to destroy the word of God. They have burned it. They've made laws against it. But it's still here. Why? Because it's indestructible. The Roman emperor Diocletian, he passed an edict that every single piece of papyri that had the word of God written on it be destroyed. 
And when he thought that he had destroyed every single piece of the word of God, every scroll, he erected a monument, and on the monument he inscribed the following words, the name of Christ is extinguished. Was it? Does anybody here have a Bible? We could see that he was wrong. The Bible is God's indestructible book, and it has stood the test of time. People have ridiculed it, but it has withstood that test of time. The cults have tried to add to it, but it's withstood that. Those who are liberals have tried to take away from the Word of God, but it's withstood that. The humanists have ignored the Word, but it's withstood that because it is destructible, indestructible Word. Notice number three. God's indispensable word gives us growth. Now, just like the word of God is indispensable in our salvation and we're saved by it, it is also indispensable in our sanctification. And that that word sanctification, think of it as our spiritual growth, our Christian growth, right? So it's indispensable in bringing us to Christ and making us saved. It's also indispensable in our growth, and we're changed by it. Look at chapter 2 of 1 Peter, chapter 2 here. And what we'll see in verses 1 and 2 is that if we are to have a healthy relationship with Scripture, there are some things that we are to avoid, and there are some things that we need to do. Notice the first thing that we are to do if we are to grow. Letter A, we are to put away evil. And he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 here, he says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Do you know why some Christians aren't hungry for the word of God and, and therefore not growing? It's because they're hungry for or have an appetite for other things. What things? Well, he lists some of them here. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, just to name a few. And when we do these things, they stunt our spiritual growth. We're not going to grow. And so he says, put it aside, put it away. The first one there is malice. Now, this is uh, resentment. This is resentment of someone else. And then he adds the word uh, deceit or, or perhaps guile in your translation. This is verse 1 here of chapter 2. And, you know, this refers to deceit. There refers to deception or, or trickery. And, and this is a deception that's there for your own purposes. And then we have the word hypocrisy um, there in, in verse 1. And we've talked about that, that hypocrites are play actors who th- appear to be spiritual, but they are not. And then he adds envy. And, and this refers to, to grudging someone else for what they have. And then he puts the word slander at the end of verse 1 here, and it's fitting that he puts this last because slander is typically the fruit of an envious heart. Someone who, who is envious, slander comes from that. And so negatively, we are to put away these evil things, but positively, he tells us, letter B, we are to long for what is pure. He tells us in verse 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Now, he's not telling us to be childish. He's telling us to be childlike. In this case, we should have an appetite for the word like a newborn baby longs for milk. For example, Cosette is a newborn baby. She longs for the milk. Are you Cosette? No? All right. Thank you. I was just making sure you were listening. All right. But many Christians are weak and are inconsistent because they don't feed on the word of God. 
They don't do it on a consistent basis. Many times, many Christians only come to the buffet on Sunday mornings and, and we get our meal and, and that's our only spiritual meal for the week. But he says here in verse 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word. Milk for a baby is not an extra. It's not an option. It's the way that they, they, they live. That's how they survive. In the same way, the word of God is the way we live. It's not an option. It's not an extra. We need the word of God, just like a newborn baby needs milk to live. And so he says, verse 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now, the way that this is worded means that these people have done something. They have tasted the kindness of God. That word if um, is, is, means since, right? Um, and, and some people have no appetite. So he's saying that you, you long for it since you have tasted uh, the kindness of the Lord. And some people, as we said, have no appetite for the word of God because they have not tasted of his kindness. Some people, um, because they're out of fellowship sometimes, they don't long for it anymore, or they step away from the word. But in a lot of cases, it's because people are unbelievers, and they, don't, they have never tasted the kindness of the Lord in terms of his grace. They have not been saved. I can't taste it for you. It's a personal taste. It's a personal decision. Everyone has to decide what they will do with the truth when they hear the truth. Some people accept it, and others reject it. The Bible says that, not just in one place, but we see it throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament, that Christ was coming, and that's what the Old Testament, it prefigured, pictured Christ coming. The Gospels tell about his life, and there's an application in the epistles and the rest of the Bible. And it talks about <clears throat> the fact that to be saved, we must put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Some people accept that, and some people reject it. My hope is that when people hear the Gospel, and that they must put their faith and trust in Christ, is that they will accept it because the Word of God is powerful and it accomplishes the purpose God intends. Back in 1839 in Edinburgh, Scotland, <clears throat> there was a man by the name of William Patton Mackay. When William was 17, he left home for college. His mother was a very godly Christian woman and didn't want him to go for fear that uh, he was heading down the path of destruction. But she let him go. She turned him over to the Lord and let him go to college. But before his departure, she gave him a Bible and she said, take this with you and read this. And in the flyleaf of the Bible, she wrote his name, William Patton McKay. And so he left for college and he began to travel with the wrong crowd. Now one day in a drunken spree, he took his Bible, he needed more money for alcohol, and he pawned his Bible to get money for alcohol. And somehow he was able to make it through college and still running with the wrong crowd. And, and he went on to be a very successful doctor. And he even rose to, the, to be the head of a very famous hospital in Edinburgh, Scotland. However, he continued to forsake his upbringing. He strayed far from God, and, and he was even elected president of the Society of Atheists in his city. <clears throat> One day while he was at the hospital, an accident victim came in and, and was treated by Dr. McKay. 
the patient learned that he only had maybe hours to live and and so he said and this patient didn't have any family and so he said to dr mckay since i only have hours to live can you go get my landlady and ask her to bring the book he agreed and they sent for the landlady and and she brought the book to this man and and he spent some time with the book and not long after the patient did die and but dr mckay he was curious he's like what was this book about and so he he went to the nurse and he says where is this book that this man had and the nurse said it was under his pillow so mckay he went in and he reached under the pillow and he pulled this book out and opened it up and he was shocked when he looked on the fly leaf of the Bible. To his amazement, it was the very Bible that he had received from his mother that he had pawned many years ago when he was in college. He saw his name written on the fly leaf of that Bible many years before. Somehow, this man who was now dead had gotten this Bible out of the pawn shop and ended up in that very hospital where Dr. McKay was serving. He was overwhelmed when he saw this, and so he stuck it under his coat, and he brought it back to his office, and he started to, to read through it, and he had never opened the Bible, and he realized that his mother had highlighted and underlined certain verses for him to read when he went off to college. And it was there in his office that this doctor who had become an atheist, he fell to his knees after reading through the Bible and reading those verses his mother had highlighted for him, and he prayed to God that God would have mercy on him and save his soul. Not too long later, he picks up a pen and he writes these words. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. That's what the word of God does. It works in people's lives to bring them to the moment where God says, come to me in salvation, or come to me in repentance and be revived again what is he saying to you this morning through his word let's stand for prayer this morning let's stand for prayer lord god thank you for being god thank you for being a god of grace and a god who continues to work even in seemingly dead circumstances lord there are some here that you have worked to draw to yourself, but they have fought you. Lord, I pray victory over them today. And I pray victory over us who may have been in church for so long and yet we've grown cold, so stale and so apathetic. God, I pray that you will revive us again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.